Let's call the meeting to order. No plan. No. We have work session items tonight. First of all, are there any public comments on work no. session related items? Everybody jump up at once. Okay. Discussion on fire department operations, city manager Tad Taylor. Well, first we passed one, we gotta go to B. Oh. Um, no. That's been postponed. That's been postponed. Oh, that B has been postponed? Yeah. Okay. All right, on the fire department operations, just wanted to give uh, Director Kozel an opportunity to just get council up to speed on <laughs> some unique situations we're experiencing in the fire department. Uh, you know, we've, we have a plan on how we're gonna address them, but we just wanted to let you know what's going on and how we're gonna take care of it, so. Good evening. Director? Appreciate you allowing me to have some time. Just wanted, uh, Fultz was probably proof brief on what's taking place within the fire department and uh, what's going to be the outcome of it. Um, currently we have a uh, um, new hire brand in here with us tonight. Um, he's a paramedic, uh, I'm sorry, EMT basic. Just started here within the last seven days. We're looking at uh, putting him through paramedic uh, training here starting April 1st. That's going to be a cost. Um, when we first were looking at uh, hiring, we decided as a group that we're going to have to expand our approach to it because when we're asking for uh, uh, prospective applicants and saying you need to be just a firefighter and a paramedic, we were getting one or two. So in discussions with the city manager, we decided, to, and with uh, IFF, we decided to expand to include EMT basics so that we could train them up to be paramedics. And we did that initially with our when we transferred over to an ALS system. So um, Brandon's our first uh, hire in that and we're gonna be sending them through paramedic, which was not something that was uh, budgeted, but we're looking, we're looking to put them through that starting April 1 and get him up to speed as a paramedic. We also had, um, I think we were also advised that one of our firefighters um, had a uh, injury, which causes him not to be working for a while now. And uh, we don't know the outcome of when, uh, when and if the um, um, firefighter of the point will be back from that injury. Due to that, and with our current staffing levels, we um, have worked together, myself and the uh, um, IFF, to try to maintain our status, which we need to be at it, as two firefighters, two firefighters slash paramedics. That is gonna incur at least 10 shifts of overtime per month from now until July 1. That is gonna cost a little bit of money predict in, in talking with um, Ed Bradford it's going to be around 25 grand just in overtime and that is with Heath Darnley being on shift on the 56 hour shift also and that's just to keep our, our current staffing levels to provide the services that our citizens demand to try to also get ahead of the curve I've had a discussion with uh, a city manager about possibly hiring now for the possible retirement of a uh, firefighter of the point he, he told me before this happened that he was anticipating on retiring in July but now without having firefighter of the point currently available for staffing I'd like to try to get ahead of that which is also possibly going to incur more costs with having another employee on that wasn't uh, initially budgeted but this is the only way I can get in front of getting somebody trained up to get us back to full staff so we don't have the overtime that could incur us another 25 grand. I know it's We're great news, but it's something that we need to try to make you aware of um, what is going to be coming up so we can still provide the services that um, we have and at the current level. One of the, one of the things that really impacts it is because we have two new employees to the department, we just can't hire them one day and put them on the shift the next day there has to be uh, an orientation process and that takes a while before they can be counted towards uh, that shift complement. Um, so that creates a problem and, and how long does that normally take? It, I guess the best answer is we'd like to say it would take a certain period of time and say it's, let's say five months. But we wanna make sure that we're, we're having all those boxes checked within our field training program. So. We usually anticipate it's around five months to get the, all the firefighter training and all the paramedic training or in-house training, even though they're gonna be a, a, a medic, so they're, they're fully up to speed and they're signed off on. 
I would never want to put somebody out on the street unless they've fully been trained in house. The other thing I just wanted to comment on, um, even with the, the new hiree uh, being an EMT, a basic EMT, as opposed to a paramedic, once he uh, goes through our training program for fire, he can still work on the ambulance as a, as a basic, uh, and it's not going to hurt our licensure. So, uh, but we, you know, eventually we'll get those both or anybody that comes in with an EMT will get trained to a, as a paramedic. But uh, it's just a matter of we, we hired two in a short period of time and they have to go through a set training program before the department feels very real comfortable with putting them on the shift uh, by, uh, as one of the two. And that's what's complicating things. And then you throw in the uh, long-term absence of one of our firefighters on an injury and uh, it just, this is the situation that resulted. Well, myself, I, I feel it's necessary to stay ahead of that curve, and I support that. Um, I think we need to be full speed ahead and kind of have people waiting to step into those positions. So good luck. I Go for it. Yeah, we've we've identified, I believe you have some people on a list. Yes, we're down to two. Down to we're two. Hopeful, but, but I just, even though uh, Firefighter LaPointe has indicated he intends to retire, and on July 1st, we've not received any written uh, documentation of that, and I'm just hesitant to put somebody uh, on to replace that position, and then they, that, and Fred decides to stay a little bit longer. Well, can we, can we start training a person with the intent of doing that? Um, do we have to hire him? Let's say the, the officer comes back, the police, or this fire officer comes back. He decides not to retire. If we had somebody in the works, do we do we have to hire them? Or? It's my intent that I'd like to have somebody hired to get him in that April program because it's a, that's a 12 to 16 month program to have him through the paramedics. So if we're going to do it, we're makes gonna, sense. We're going to do it. We're yeah. Gonna do it. So we, yeah. The I, we longer you wait, the, back back, the no. longer you wait, the more you're going to spend in overtime, and the more Correct. the longer it's going to take to get up, get you up to speed again. Correct. Okay. Is there a way that the police officers can help? <laughs> are they cross trained? They're just, we just are trained as uh, uh, firefighters. We do have one EMT, Sergeant Smaling. He does assist with those situations whenever we have a, a staffing issue, but we always wanna to try to maintain our, our two paramedics. That's, a, that's the goal. The other thing too is we're down one position in the police department also, so it'd almost be a situation of robbing Peter to pay Paul. I have a couple questions. How much is the, does the paramedic training cost? Five thousand five hundred and seventy-one dollars, I think. Be sure about that one dollar. Well, I'm currently writing the revenue sharing, um, attempting to do the revenue sharing for that. So that's why I have that right on my at the top, <coughs> tip of my uh, tongue. There's no change. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would have to um, go along with uh, what Mayor Zelinsky has said. We have to be prepared. All it's going to take is one bad accident or one one situation where we're understaffed, and you know, could be a problem. So, I think you have to go ahead and do it. I agree. And you got one thing I just want to bring up um, also is that within our license to medical control, if we have a response that we're requested to assist with our mutual aid agreement to North Flight, we do have to go out to the county. And we have. When that happens, we backfill the station to make sure that we are here to provide the services for the citizens. Okay. That's something that we, we automatically do. I've had agreement with the, the group that if we go up, extend beyond a certain point, we automatically uh, drop our all hands and we backfill because that's what we're here for. This is what the citizens you know, pay for, is to us to be here. So that does happen. Um, a lot of that's a result of the staffing of North Flight. They're going through the same issues that we are. Um, so we've had a lot of, we had a lot of calls last year. We've already had a, a lot of calls this year on the same aspect. They come in and help us if we're on something and they have, there's another call that happens in the city. But we're always going to make sure that we're here to, to service the citizens of uh, Manistee. Yes. Speaking of that help, uh, is there any opportunity for us 
to hire any of those people to backfill some of that vacant rather than paying the OQ? I would think that wouldn't fall within our uh, contractual services with the fire department. Okay. Yeah. Our contract with the department. The um, training for the paramedics, uh, is that something we've gone to in the past at, for? Um, revenue sharing? Uh, yeah, revenue yes. sharing, thank you. Back in uh, 2013, Chief Bachman put it into it um, for, uh, I think we might have even done it twice. We've done it for funding to assist paying for the paramedic program. So are you going to try to do the same thing? i doing it today. Okay, great. Put it together. Oh, that's what you're putting together. Okay. Yes. Well, I think if you're looking for support on your plan, I think you found it here tonight. So okay. correct me if I'm wrong. Well, and we're, we'll be monitoring that and taking a look at the, you know, the pros and cons. And I appreciate the support if we, you know, if we do come back with that uh, recommendation. But we, we got to do a little bit more investigation on, you know, if we hire somebody early, there's ramifications of, you know, the, the employee that the schedule replaced not leaving early, plus that incurs some additional costs where we're already looking at a lot of overtime. So we, we just got to run some numbers and see what's going to work out the best for us. Any other questions? Thank you. Next, city manager, presentation of quarterly strategic plan update. Yeah, if you could put that up. Just wanted to share with council what we've been working on in terms of meeting the goals laid out by council. And anything in red is something that's new since the last presentation. Um, under 1.2, uh, two four package in the industrial park underneath there's some um, talk about the recycling center the uh, possibly expansion of that one of the things I'm working on is um, trying to work with Manistee Catholic Central and see if they could get with PCA and and get another trailer and we could have our cardboard and paper recycling there uh, right now we, we it costs us about Twelve or thirteen thousand dollars a year to get that taken out of our center, where this way they could have another revenue stream. And the 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 way that that would have to work is is if we removed our our cardboard bins from the recycling center, would just leave the one uh, one container there for everything else. And I've reached out to them to see if they would consider moving that, allowing us to move that to the same location, we would fence it in and maintain it because I just don't think our recycling program would be as effective if we had citizens going to the current recycling center for one thing and then going back to the south side of town for the other. So we're still waiting to hear back from them. So it could be a real win-win for everybody. So um, hopefully we'll have some more information in, of a positive nature going forward. Is that the alternate site that you're talking about? Yeah, as an alternate site. Um, on the next page, there's just some of our tasks that have been completed uh, for you to review. In terms of rail relocation, uh, myself and board chair Jeff Dons had a, another telephone conference call with CSX Railroad and Marquette Railroad. Um, the response was kind of tepid. Um, they're not certain that it, there's a lot of value for them to be involved in the cost of the relocation. Um, and then this week, we also met with our state representative and state senator talking about possible state dollars to help us along that uh, direction. It's gonna be, this is a multi, multi-year process and we're just trying to get some traction moving forward. So we are working, trying to do that. I think there's uh, a lot of benefits if we could get that relocated, but we'll see. Um, some of the other highlights, um, redevelopment ready. Real pleased to, to point out that our county planner is stepping in with the redevelopment ready community uh, process. And he's done some training. He's working on the, the property cards to, for all of those identified 
uh, redevelopment site. So he's moving forward on that. And while I'm on that, that's been just a great program for us. Uh, we're getting good results out of the county planning uh, department. We're still working on the uh, um, asset management plan and, and bringing back, bringing into it our facilities and, th and of that nature. And we'll be presenting that uh, at the next work session. Um, management evaluations, not a lot there. Under energy efficiencies, we had representative from Consumers Energy came in and met with Jeff McCoola to talk about possibilities of doing an evaluation to see where we might uh, best use some dollars. There is a uh, grant uh, available out there, I think it's $25,000 that we could tap into for energy efficiency upgrades. So we wanna go through that process and identify some easy uh, solutions and then apply for that grant and move forward. Um, let's see what, what else. Not the rest, uh, nothing really earth shattering. And you can look at those at your leisure. And if you saw anything that you want uh, on further information on or clarification, please let me know. But I, I just wanted to hit a few of the higher priorities that we've been working on. Are we gonna update this anytime soon? Well, we certainly need to. And what my, my preferred option is that we need to, to, instead of just updating this, we need to go through a, a strategic planning session that I would like to have the community involved in. And so that's gonna be one of the things we're gonna look at to see if we could even get that amount of money budgeted for this coming year. Um, because this is, this is okay, but it's been a number of years. It, it predated uh, my arrival here of getting the community involved in helping us set some priorities and help us uh, put together a strategic plan. Well, a lot of them, you know, you need updates from AES and we're not currently working with AES. So right. Kind of redundant to have it here. I, I couldn't agree more. And then some of them have Tim on there. Do we even work with Tim anymore? No, we, we don't work with, really don't work with AES at all. Right, yeah. Tim's not with AES anymore, correct? Nope. Well, at bare minimum, for the next time you have this, could we get rid of or edit out a AES? We can. I think it's confusing to see it in there. Yeah, we can, we can do that, and we can try to reassign that to someone else on staff if that's a possibility. I would like to reassign it. I don't necessarily want to take it out because there's still stuff in here that we need to address. But Well, I don't disagree. I just want AES out of there and have it reassigned, and it's not relevant to have them in there. It's been over a year since we've paid them. Okay. I have to get that done. Um, waterways. With the boat livery, have we had any success getting more seasonal slips? I have not heard back from them on their meetings, so I'll send a note to her and see if she just hasn't replied back to me, so I haven't heard though. The other thing on the locks, how are we doing with the blocking the bathrooms? Is that moving right along? Uh, we should be done with that whole process in two weeks. Oh, great. Thank you. Are we and a lot of these say ongoing. It doesn't really explain what we're doing. Um, are we doing anything with blight still? Well, the newest thing that we're going to do with blight, and this is good, what's going to be in your will be in your weekly update. We have an opportunity to um, put in a grant for up to is it fifty thousand? Up to fifty thousand dollars for blight, and we're looking at uh, that home on Duffy. Yes, to Duffy. And whatever the address yeah, is, it's too duffy. Yeah. And um, yeah. it's kind of a, it was kind of a, uh, we didn't. By the time we got working on it, there wasn't uh, ample time to come to council and get authorization. So we're going to come back at the next uh, council meeting and ask for forgiveness, and we're going to apply for the grant. But we thought it was an opportunity at fifty thousand dollars to apply for it and possibly get that taken care of. Is there? qualifications for the 50? 
is there something that you have to go through or you have to you have to submit a grant okay. and um, I don't know what all the details are involved in the grant the police department is handling that in conjunction with the city attorney um, because the problem with uh, is getting the ownership of that property apparently the previous owner uh, is deceased has no family we have to go to, through court to get title to or get uh, a authorization to tear it down so we're working on that as well as putting in the grant for that but in terms of blight um, again that's something that I tried to get in last year in the for the budget it just didn't fit we're gonna try again this year if not we just continue what we've been doing and, and have the police department handle it at, on an as available basis um, if I could the uh, uh, it on the draft RFP for the outdoor performance venue, is this the the, the band shell? Yes. The first yep. street. Any yep. updates on where we're at with that? Yep. Is the RFP ready or? Yes, it's it's in a it's third iteration. I'm working on it, and uh, the next review is going to be um, probably first part of next week. I'm going to get it out to a couple of people to give me the input, and then we'll get it out. And what we have to do con uh, concurrently with that is uh, we have to put some feelers out for a funder to do that, to do the pay for the feasibility study. We have a couple of ideas uh, that of individuals that might be able to help us with that. And what's, what's the approximate cost of the feasibility study? That's about, for the feasibility study, I, I'm not certain. It might be in the neighborhood of 15 to 25,000 in that neighborhood. What's going on with the fire authority? I know you've been Still waiting to hear. We had a, a tentative date. Uh, unfortunately, the public safety director was not uh, available that date, so we're looking for other dates from uh, Manistee Township and Filer Township. So we've got the request out. We're waiting to hear back from them for some dates. Could there be a possibility that they could help us with our um, short Handed. I don't think they have anybody that's qualified to do that. The, the, the biggest thing is is that when we bring a new firefighter in, um, we have to make sure that he understands the way we operate and the way we do things, and it's a pretty structured process. Mm -hmm. So you can't just pull somebody in and put them in there because it's not fair to that individual or the department or the community. So that's it's not unfortunate. It's just the way that we make sure we have highly trained and highly competent individuals working in our fire department. Also in on the boating facilities, it still has First Street Beach docks in good shape. Uh, we may want to update that with what where we are with the RFP. That's uh, uh, 3.2.1 uh, second bullet. We may want to update it because again we we approved right the expenditure. I, I think that's referring to the skid gears on the first year beach. Oh, okay. Yeah, at the oh, okay. yeah. But there's no uh, no mention of the of the the marina itself. And are we have we gotten anything back on? Uh, a date and I uh, contacted the insurance agent again today he said normally that takes about two weeks for the underwriters to approve or deny the funding request <coughs> he thought today was the two-week mark so he was reaching out to them again hopefully we'll hear something this week anybody else <coughs> moving right along Discussion on 2019 construction projects. Boy, this is going to be a long one. <laughs> Need a stretch, fast and great. I'm happy about that. Lots of construction. I hope I told him I had five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, public safety director took most of your time, so uh, he usually does. And I'm, I'm willing to bet he put the timer in the last week's presentation to kind of keep keep me moving through that. <laughs> Hopefully, we don't have that this week. So. Um, I just thought it'd be a good idea to kind of update council on what we've got planned this year for capital improvement, essentially what our construction projects are for 2019. <laughs> the summary of the large projects include what we've uh, termed rural development projects. 
we've got a phase 1A, a phase 1B, so that's the current uh, funding that we've got in place. It includes uh, wastewater collection and some storm sewer improvements. And then phase two, which we are applying for the funds and have been working on for a very long time, um, both contracts A and B, which will include a conveyance, new conveyance of sewage to the treatment plant and then also improvements to the treatment plant. And then the 12th Street uh, reconstruction, the marina docks and the uh, river walk repairs that you just mentioned, and then the pilot drinking water project. So the real development phase uh, A1 is essentially uh, a larger project than what we did last summer when we put liners in uh, the sewers. Um, this year we're planning on doing over five and a half miles of sewer rehab. So those are pipes that are in structurally deficient and uh, we'll be lining those and giving those another 50 plus years of life. It also includes uh, over 90 manholes. And then um, the reason why we picked those is because they show, uh, number one, they're structurally in poor condition, but more important, this is to support the wet weather corrective action program where we're trying to reduce the inflow and infiltration and essentially the flows that get to the plant. This project is currently estimated just in the construction dollars at two and a half million dollars and plan on bidding that out in May. You'll see that there's a lot of consistency with bidding out this summer and uh, starting construction this summer, but the completions are in 2020. And that completion date is really aligns with what our NPDES permit requires us to have our wet weather corrective action program completed. And here's a map of the city. It shows uh, some of the different types of sewer repairs, uh, the different spot repairs, the cured in place pipelining, um, and then also manhole repairs. So you can see there's three districts that through the saw grant, we were able to collect all the data that show us what the pipe conditions are, but then also through the uh, flow studies that we've done and the flow monitoring, showing where the, the highest amount of inflow and infiltration is coming into our system. The rural development phase 1B is extensions, uh, primarily extensions of st uh, storm sewer that helps to uh, reduce surface flooding. Um, it potentially can also uh, reduce ponding and water that gets into basements, uh, subsurface drains, which then ends up in the uh, sanitary sewer system. Um, we've actually, if you remember, during last year's bu budget cycle, council uh, provided $200,000 from the oil and gas fund to specifically reconstruct local streets. So what we've done is identified uh, a ca candidate, and it's actually the project that we talked about and selected last year as, uh, and I'll have a map that'll show the locations, <clears throat> but we were able to justify the storm sewer improvements with this uh, rural development phase 1B in conjunction with the um, money to rebuild local streets that council provided. And so now we've got a million dollars to put towards this effort. And we'd at, we've actually been able to double the street impacts by matching those two pots of money and combining two, um, two of our goals. <clears throat> Again, that'll be bid out uh, this May and um, with completion, we expect to begin construction this summer and completion next year. Will that be bid out as, as a um, both projects together, the, the construction? Yeah, each construction? one of these slides is a specific construction project. Or so that'll be one bid for both the sewer work and the road construction? Correct. Okay. So as you can see on the map, um, it kind of looks like a coping saw. But what we, when we looked at what local streets that we could upgrade, uh, we brought back a map uh, to council that showed all the local streets that needed reconstruction. We then took away the ones that needed water and sewer work below them because we didn't have identified funds um, this year for, uh, that, uh, for those improvements. So we specifically needed to look at local streets that need to be reconstructed. Um, we selected this area because a lot of the east-west streets were rehabbed when we did the hot in place a number of years ago, but we were trying to get to the north 
north and south streets and have some impact on those. We also know that uh, specifically in the area of Militzer and the blocks that surround that, when those sewers were separated back in the 80s, instead of building new storm sewer, they simply took the catch basins, disconnected them from the sanitary sewer, they removed the bottom out of those so that when the water flows into those catch basins, they infiltrate into the ground and disappear. Now that's an effective manner of getting rid of the storm water unless you've got a storm that um, exceeds what the capacity of those small catch basins can and then you've got surface ponding. And we also know that in the spring when we got our annual thaw and that there's still frost in the ground, the flooding around that area is tremendous. So when we studied the local street maps and then looked at what available storm sewer we had, we identified that Militzer, uh, I'm sorry, Fremont Street, which is the street that's on the right-hand side of that picture, actually has piped storm sewer and had capacity for future uh, connections to it. So we plan on extending storm sewer to the west from Fremont along one block of Hugh Street, and then on 2nd Avenue at the bottom of the screen, one block to get us over to Militzer, and then reconstructing Militzer um, for two blocks, and we'll start draining that. I've talked to some of the residents, I've talked to the council person in that district. This will not solve all the problems in that area. But what this does is it provides a couple branches of storm sewer so that as the future roads are reconstructed, we can then, then extend from that storm sewer and continue to solve the, f the flooding problems that occur there. I will also note that the right-of-ways in this area are 40 feet, 40 and what is that, 50? So typically a right-of-way is 66 feet, which gives us a lot more room to work in to put sidewalks, the roadway, utilities, trees. So um, we've had to tighten up our, our, the width of the streets. That's, it's actually going to get wider than what it is today, but we're trying to be sensitive to driveways and front yards, um, the boulevard trees, and so it's a, it's a unique challenge for the engineers to get through. Are you going to send a letter out to those residents um, and advise them when the time comes of this work that's being done? Yeah, typically I like to do the neighborhood meetings where we bring bring everybody out and give them, let them know what the expectations are. Um, I think we could probably schedule that pretty quickly. Uh, I think the plans, we just did a 60% plan review last Friday. So we're at the point where um, we've got a pretty good handle. We know where things are going. And um, so in the next iteration of those plans, and when we do that review, then I think we'll be ready to meet with the residents. Okay. Rural development phase two A, um, and really phase, phases phase two A and B are trying to get the uh, excessive flows to the plant from our current SSO 18 at Ramstill and Fifth Street to the plant and then setting up the plant to be able to handle and treat those flows. So contract 2A is what you see at the dash line there. Once we eliminate the overflow into the storm sewer at SSO 18, we will need to convey all, all of that flow to the plant. Currently there's a 36 inch pipeline um, which is shown I, it's kind of a grayish blue and it runs down 5th Street, uh, Kosciuszko to 8th Street. We will be um, diverting the flow from that and building a new pipeline that's in yellow with a new 48 inch sewer. Um, that sewer is extremely deep. It'll go down, it'll start at, at 5th Street, run two blocks of Ramstill Street to 7th Street, uh, turn east on Ramstill, I'm sorry, turn east on 7th Street down to High Street, and then it'll cross um, a small section of Morton property that we've obtained easement and then enter the 10 acres that uh, we're planning to acquire from Morton to the uh, treatment plant. That sewer is extremely large and it's also extremely deep and there's a major uh, storm sewer that's also on that street. Morton has a major brine line, we've got water lines. Um, so this will, be, this will require reconstruction of that street basically from the curb line to the curb line. Um, so all of those segment, segments of local street will be completely reconstructed as part of this project <coughs> this year. Is that part of the two million as well? That's all factored in into the cost? Yes, yes. 
And so any of those residents, well, all of them, all of them on where we have abandoned existing 36 interceptor, they, they have sewer hookups. Yeah, no, and those will be disconnected too. It's labeled as abandoned. We're abandoning it as our interceptor sewer. Um, and correct me if I misstate this, but we intend to keep that because it'll act, actually act as storage. And because that's an interceptor sewer, there's not any local laterals or local sewers that tie to that um, along that stretch, except for High Street. Is that correct? So, so along the along the path of that interceptor, typically there's local sewers, local sewer mains that collect from your houses, and then there's points where it discharges, and a lot of that area actually goes through the Eighth and Vine pump st pump station. Okay. So, it's absolutely the goal not to take away sewer service from any of those homes. When when these roads are reconstructed, is it going to be the same thing? Are we talking about sidewalks and and basically recurbing? and uh, adjusting the street widths? So Ramsell Street currently has curb and gutter um, and we're gonna put it back to the same width okay. so that there's no impact on, on the street width. We are actually gonna have to remove the existing local sewer for this construction and the local water main for this construction, put the deep pipe in there and then build the local sewer up higher and we're planning on uh, building the water main uh, benched up above that. Um, we've got to work through some DEQ issues with permitting and, and separation distances, but um, it's, it's a pretty complex little project. On 7th Street, um, that's a local street. I think there's one block that has curb and the other two do not, correct? So we're planning on, rep the, the policy that the city has carried for uh, curb and gutter replacement is major streets get curb and gutter and will get widened to the to the, the standards. Local streets, um, if they've got curb and gutter and we do construction, we'll either replace or, or repair them. And then other streets that do not have curb and gutter, we will not put curb and gutter unless it's necessary to control stormwater. Um, we've had a couple local streets in the past where the residents wanted the curb and gutter and actually did a special assessment and paid those over, what, a 10 year period? Seven, Seven year period, um, and paid for the, specifically the curb and gutter themselves. Is it that much more money to put those in, the curb and gutter? Yes. And, and that's really the reason why that, that policy is there is, is because we try to stretch these dollars as far as we can do you know um, how much it would be, like the ballpark? Do you have any idea? It's around 30 bucks a foot, but I, we do have, right now, because of the drainage issues, we do have curb and gutter plans for the site. For all of it? Yes, for the main plan for the site. So 7th Street will get curb and gutter because of the drainage. So it'll just be that little intersection at High Street. Well, actually, everywhere we cross then gets replaced with curb. Yeah, and then at the corners where we Any other questions? Oops, I went. So uh, rural development phase 2B is the, um, the improvements at the treatment plan itself. And we'll come back to you um, with this concept, but um, internally we're kicking around uh, the possibility of renaming the plant to the clean water recovery facility which has been a trend in wastewater for a number of years. Um, it just changes the, changes what the, the connotation of what the plan actually does. But essentially what this project would do is upgrade the headworks to the plant, which is where we do primary treatment. It also will um, provide some primary treatment to all the excess flows and then have a separate pumping chamber so that we can pump um, the excess wet weather flows up into storage tanks and then we construct uh, three tanks that would have about six million gallons of storage. That is being designed so that when that storage, those storage tanks fill up and the, the wet weather event is, is passed, 
that the tanks will be tanks will be emptied back into the treatment plant, and then we'll receive uh, secondary and tertiary treatment um, before it is discharged. This plan is based on what the uh, DEQ calls the remedial design storm. You've probably heard Sean mention that several times, but it is essentially the storm event that the state has determined that all the community that all communities have to handle. Okay. So um, we've modeled our system. Um, we've gone through, a tr the engineers have gone through a tremendous amount of work to determine the volume we need to store and meet those requirements. This plant in this upgrade will have a uh, kind of an emergency bypass. So if there is a 100 year, 1,000 year storm event and too much water gets to that plant and it's in danger of flushing all the processes out of that plant, there's actually a process where it will bypass the plant. It'll still get primary treatment and it'll get disinfection before it goes into the lake. So it gets two of the three processes that we do to, to treat sewage, but it, it doesn't get the full process. And um, you never anticipate that those are gonna happen, but it's always a possibility. And that's a pretty standard, um, pretty standard design feature. This is a, it's a pretty busy drawing, but it shows the uh, new headworks, which is the rectangular, uh, kind of towards the bottom right, and then uh, just below the three tanks that we're talking about. The fourth circle is dashed in. Uh, there's room to add a fourth tank if for some reason somewhere down the road uh, the community needs that, um, but we're not anticipating the need to construct that, and it's not in the plans at this time. So again, that'll store uh, six million gallons per day or per event. We've got the 12th Street reconstruction. Um, I believe this is the only major street work that we've got uh, slated for this year, but it includes uh, reconstructing 12th Street from Maple to US 31. Um, this does bring, would bring that roadway up to the major street standards, including curb and gutter, the proper lane widths, it'll add bike lanes and also uh, supplement all the, the sidewalk that is currently there so that we've got sidewalk on both sides in between the two high schools. This project has been complete, completely designed. Um, the full design package and specifications have been submitted to the state of Michigan. They've approved them, they've listed it, and it is out for bids right now. The state of Michigan actually bids this project out because we were uh, awarded a $375,000 grant through the small urban uh, funds. <clears throat> and so we expect uh, the first week in March that the state will open the bids on that. And we expect to have a contractor uh, begin construction in June. We've already held the, the neighborhood meeting on this uh, project. And um, one of the unique things that's, that has to happen before we have a contractor in place is um, the state of Michigan will not allow uh, tree removal, do you remember what the date is? Is it March or April? They will not allow tree removals after April 1st up through a certain time frame because there's migratory Indiana brown bats or is that what it is or something like that. When they migrate they can <coughs> nest in those trees so um, the city public works is actually going to remove the trees that are necessary for the project and we've got those flagged up and um, I've started talking to some of the residents about those. Was there any uh, traffic study on the impact of 12th Street and 31 um, traffic circle or traffic light or, or anything? Because that intersection can be busy now, and I'm just wondering once it becomes, you know, a, you know, a really well-designed street, what it's going to impact on. Uh, we didn't do one. We didn't do one for this project. Um, when Family Fair was built, they conducted one with the full expectation that it would warrant a light at that intersection. Um, and actually, I think they went back and, and did a second iteration of the, it's called traffic warrants, and they did it during the school and after the store was built. But the state, the state of Michigan, before they allow any traffic lights to be placed, you have to meet a certain amount of traffic warrants and it didn't come close to meeting the warrants at that time. 
The only reason I mention that is because I know that the, the highway or the redevelopment in Filer, they were looking at putting in traffic circles instead of lights at, I think, 28th Street and 21st Street. And I thought maybe this would be another opportunity if. Uh, we haven't discussed any roundabouts there. Has there been any discussion about um, putting 12th Street all the way through to Cherry Street? Yeah, the city actually, well, this, when the school, Manistee High School was built, Manistee High School acquired right away from Oak Street all the way out to Cherry Street. And then they built what is now 12th Street as a driveway to the school and then dedicated, after a number of years, dedicated that road to the city and then dedicated <coughs> all the right of way out to Cherry Street. So we've got right of way for that. Um, when I worked with the engineering firm the previous years, we did estimates on that. Currently, I'm not aware, unless you've heard anything, there's, there's no grand opportunities for new construction right now. Um, been kind of watching for about 10 years. Um, but yeah, certainly I think that would be a, a desirable to extend that all the way through. Certainly would make a difference for police and EMS. So here's a slide that we showed in the neighborhood meeting of the existing street cross section. And, oops. And then what it would look like afterwards. Again, we've got the marina dock, so uh, just waiting on the underwriters from the insurance company. If they um, approve the, the funding amounts, then uh, we'll issue our notice to proceed and work on the contracts with Fisher Contracting. Um, we expect that uh, they would mobilize as early as they could. Hopefully, if weather allows, they could get in here uh, March, April, start doing the demo and setting the docks, and our goal is to have that portion substantially completed before the marina opens for uh, boat traffic. And then the pilot uh, drinking water uh, grant. The state of Michigan, when they were revising all of the uh, service line rules and regulations, um, I, my understanding is they anticipated that communities were gonna need help in implementing all of those rules. <coughs> So they did a round of, of invited communities to apply for a pilot grant and they're evaluating how communities are spending that money, how much it costs to actually upgrade all the lines and create the inventories. Uh, the city of, Man of Manistee received $331,000 towards that effort. Uh, they gave us a one year time frame, which would have ended in May of, of 2019 um, they've held, is it quarterly meetings that they've been doing or monthly? More like once or <laughs> So every few months uh, they've been meeting with communities and, and representatives to see how the progress is going. And essentially by the time they got the grant awards out, the new rules got established, communities determined how they were going to do the work. Um, you were almost into the winter time and there's not much that can be done over the winter time. So they are, uh, they sent us notification last week that they plan on extending the deadline of that to September, which will then um, give me some confidence that we'll be able to expend all those funds. <clears throat> what we've done uh, to this point is we digitized all of our uh, water records uh, in regards to the service lines. We've also <coughs> identified physically where the curb stops and where the services are on just about every property in the community. All of that's been put into our GIS system or is in the process. We've also been what we call potholing. So we're, we're not sure what the services are. We've actually been excavating around the curb stops and then we can identify what the pipe material is on the homeowner side as well as on the city side. And then when the conditions uh, warrant, we've been replacing service lines. All the materials, all the uh, data collection, um, everything has been uh, to this point been reimbursed by the state through this grant but we also are expending some of our staff time in the water department to do a lot of this work and all of their salaries and, and will be reimbursed to us so it'll actually uh, partially be a reimbursement for our 
operational costs for this year and for next year. Um, is there, this is a large sum of money, but I don't think it covers everybody who would have a service line that needed replacement, correct? That is very correct. So how are you choosing them? Um, we are, all of our construction projects for the past 25 years, when we've done water, <clears throat> water projects or sewer projects, we've been replacing the curb stops with copper services. So there's um, close to 40% of our community that we know exactly where, um, that, we, that we have copper and we um, are able to map that out. And then we're going through the records and we're identifying other locations where there is copper and, um, and then we're basically potholing in, in the community trying to find out uh, in areas where we don't know. So, so far, uh, a lot of those efforts have been on the north side and uh, we, we, with this money, we can't do all of them. So we're trying to get a, a kind of a statistical representation um, so that we can forecast out what we're gonna need to do. When the DEQ started to clarify these new rules, um, originally we thought if it was a galvanized service that we were gonna have to replace it from from the main all the way at way all the way to the house. Now they've clarified that you have to, if you're going to replace one portion of it, you need to replace both of them. And um, there's still it depends on who I talk to in the DEQ, but most of them are saying um, there has to be a lead component that was somewhere in that service line, and for it to qualify for a complete replacement. So um, we have found one lead gooseneck, which is just a 18 inch piece that comes off the main uh, through all the, the work that we've done so far. Um, and in 15 years, we found four of those in the community. So it's a very, very low percentage of them. So anybody that's got the rest of them, so say it's galvanized, um, that doesn't get replaced or, or it's still out? <coughs> What, what we've done with this grant is if there's copper on the homeowner side and galvanized on the city side, we've been replacing that galvanized to make it whole all okay. the way. But most of the city is copper, right? Uh, I wouldn't say most, but we're getting close to half. Okay. All the projects that I've went through today, so um, the coping saw project that's Militzer, the block of Hughes, 2nd Avenue, Fremont, um, 7th Street, Ramstow, all of those will have new services when those pipelines are put in. So we're continuing that practice. Okay. Will any of this address some of the issues we have where the pipes freezing from the service to the homes? Uh, potentially. So we had, we had one service that froze on the north side last week. Um, the city had, there was a galvanized service from the house to the main. Um, they cho the homeowner chose to replace the galvanized on their side of it, so we replaced our side of it at the same time, and that would qualify for reimbursement under this. I, in order to replace all the galvanized services in the city, um, do you remember, I did an estimate on it, I think it was about $8 million. What's that? I'm thinking $5 million. I'll go with $5 million, at least $5 million to convert all those. The next benchmarks that the state has set out is we have to have what they call a, a desktop inventory. Is that correct? correct? So we have to do a desktop inventory. So we'll take the data from this and we've got to tell them, here's what we believe that we've got out in the community. Here's where we think that there's uh, non-copper services. Here's where we think there could be lead services. At this point, uh, the lead is just non-existent. But then, is it 20? So in 2025, in 2020, we have to have that desktop. This will get us just about to that point. In 2025, we've got to have a plan that identifies all the ones we're not aware of and then a plan to fix anything that's got lead in it. 
and then we've got 20 years to then start the replacement. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jeff, but I just want to clarify, but this has nothing to do with the areas where the service is shallow and wintertime you have to run um, water through the wintertime. Not necessarily. It's not addressing those specifically. Whenever we find that opportunity, um, we certainly take that opportunity. When we do the new construction and replace those services, you know, those will, those will get re repaired that way. So when you total up all these projects, um, total project costs, we're looking at over $21.5 million of construction coming up or beginning this year. <coughs> so in a year from now, I, I don't expect to have anything but gray hairs left. But it's a tremendous amount of work. Any questions? Any more questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Council members have any other things they'd like to talk about? The only thing I wanted to is is in the in your notes you talked about the uh, the alcohol ban on the Manistee River uh, and the fact that uh, the county the city uh, law enforcement apparently uh, was left out of any conversation or or any decision making process. Uh, has there been any follow-on with any of our congressional leaders or, or delegates to, to understand exactly why they chose to do this? I mean, you know, it, it, it seems ridiculous uh, that, uh, that they would make this rule arbitrarily without really kind of getting the community at large involved in it since, I mean, again, the river goes through our county. I can read your well, response from Mr. Uh, from Jeff. Um, don't. Um, anyways, he, this is a response to the city. Just received a call from the forest supervisor, and she said they aren't going to implement the ban this year, and put together a group to work on the issue, assuming there is an issue. Yeah, but just further that, that uh, Jeff Dons has done a heck of a job representing this community in in this endeavor. Uh, we did speak with the to our state representative, state senator about this. He had reached out uh, to other um, state legislators and even reached out to some of the federal legislators. And uh, no one was aware of this. No one knew that an, an issue existed. There had been no outreach. So uh, I applaud Jeff for his efforts in this. And uh, at least we have a stay for a year and we'll go from there. I think that online petition was at 35,000 last I heard. Yeah. It's just unbelievable the amount of people. Yeah. Anything else? I'm going to be attending a DDA meeting tomorrow. For the last most of the day, they're going to do strategic plan. Council members have anything they'd like me to bring up or talk about, uh, please feel free to either email me or tell me after the meeting. With that, we're adjourned. I gave you a leadership. Um, it's been through that. Much um, I, I don't even know. Um,